I just want to plug that next month, uh, we're going to try something a little bit different. We're going to do a series of lightning talks. So everybody here should get involved. Uh, go sign up at tiny.cc, A2 Pi Data Lightning. Provide your first and last name, email address. You don't even have to tell us what your talk title is if you, if you don't want to. Really, it's just meant to be um, unpolished talks. Talk about anything, whether it's from anything from maybe you're hiring at your company, job descriptions, right? Uh, projects that you're hacking on, tinkering with. If you're in academia, any projects that you're working on. They're meant to be 10 minutes or less. You don't have to take up the full 10 minutes. You can take up five if you wanted to. Just tell us about your data journey, your data project, even your data failures. It would be greatly appreciated because data science isn't perfect, right? So please do go and sign up. We've got a couple of people signed up already, but uh, please go on and, and sign up. This will be uh, October 10th, I think. You'll see the, the date up there. OK, so uh, obviously acknowledgments. We'd like to thank NumFocus, TD Ameritrade for sponsoring the space. Also doing Duo for uh, letting us uh, take some of Brian's time, uh, as well as for Midas for obviously providing the food here. <coughs> Uh, as always, important points for people who are new here, emergency exits, there's one right here, and there's one right outside the front door that uh, on your right-hand side. Uh, we're always soliciting for speakers, so if you would like to speak in the future or you would like to nominate a, a good speaker, whether it's the, uh, local or uh, across the country, please uh, uh, help us reach uh, the far depths of the da data science world. And as always, we're welcoming feedback, so either contact us on our, our meetup uh, page or you can always tweet at, tweet at us at uh, PyData Ann Arbor or email us at PyDataAnnArbor at gmail.com. And for the sake of our speaker, uh, please hold all of your questions to the end, unless they're quick, okay? And remember that you're in a borrowed space, so please clean up after yourself, uh, if at all possible, or maybe help out others too, that forget. Uh, I'd like to always read our code of conduct just as a reinforcement. So uh, PyData is dedicated to providing a, a harassment-free meeting experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, physical appearance, body size, race or religion, we do not tolerate harassment of meeting participants in any form. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any of our meetup events. Be kind to others. Do not insult or put down other attendees. Behave professionally. Remember, remember that harassment and sexist, racist or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for Pi Data. Attendees of violating these rules may be asked to leave the meetup at the sole discretion of the meetup organizers. But thank you for helping us uh, make this a welcoming, friendly environment for everybody. Um, quick icebreakers again. Um, here's an easy one. So turn to either somebody on your left or your right, introduce yourself, and tell them what is your favorite mode of transportation or, or the mode that you get, get to work at. Right. I like to walk. Yeah, I, I, have, I have my bike. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I only live a mile. Training? Zoom in. Miller and Maple, yep. Yeah. Now, how do you find bikes? I'm going to show you. You know how there's one of the I think there's one of the I haven't had too many issues. I've, I've kind of mapped my route out to like avoid major roads and stuff like that. There's only a little little bit of Miller Road that I have to ride on. Hey, and we're back. Reason to say. Thank you. So hopefully you will leave today at least knowing one other person. Uh, we also like to talk about sort of this month in data science, just a, a quick little tidbit. So I don't know if anybody heard, but uh, both uh, Facebook and Microsoft partnered up to offer this, uh, the, I guess, open source uh, way to define, um, or, or open source standard to define uh, neural networks so that you can make it transferable across different frameworks. They call it Onyx or ONNX. So check it out. It's called the Open Neural Network Exchange. And also, um, the Big Data Ignite uh, nonprofit group out of uh, Western Michigan reached out, and they're having a conference out in uh, Grand Rapids from uh, September 27th to 29th, and they are, uh, regist registration is open. They also offered some discounts, so if you're interested in attending, shoot us a message, and we'll get the, uh, the coupon code to you. So this is bigdataignite.com. 
Uh, I am not sure. 30% I want to say. I will, I will believe you. I will trust you. <laughs> and again, uh, O'Reilly has been kind enough to offer us some free ebooks. So if you haven't signed up for one, it's at O'Reilly.com, front slash pub, front slash Pi Data and Arbor. So you can grab one of these six ebooks. And if you actually go ahead and clone our GitHub repo, these slides will be up there as well. Or you can just ask me at the end. And always, as always, uh, if you have any announcements about job hires, uh, you can always uh, send me an email, hopefully two weeks prior to the meetup, and I can add them to the slides. TD Ameritrade is hiring both for our uh, advanced analytics team as well as our uh, analytics center of excellence. So they're looking for both data science, data analysts at multiple levels, and this is for Ann Arbor location, uh, as well as for my team. I work on the advanced technology team as a data scientist, exploring uh, uh, emerging technologies that help us differentiate ourselves from our competitors. And so we do, I, I do, a ton of research and development. So we get to build out brand new proofs of concepts uh, that are meant to sort of prove out the point of any sort of new technology. So please, uh, if you're interested, either go to careers.tdmerger.com or chat with me afterwards. We'd love to have you. Next event, again, is the Pi Data Lightning Talk, October 10th. So please go and sign up. And then with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. So Brian Witherspoon, uh, coming from uh, Dual Security. Uh, he is an engineer on their data engineering team. And today he's going to be talking about biggish data. And I'm sure he'll, he'll tell you more. So let's welcome uh, Brian. Yes, I think so. Can everyone hear me in the back? Great. Thank you, Sean. Um, thank you all for coming here today and allowing me to speak to you. Um, so just, uh, this is my first time at Pi Data, so I, I kind of want to just do a little quick poll, um, get to know you guys a little bit. Uh, if you are a, if you consider yourself to be a data scientist, can you just show hands, okay? Um, how about uh, like a web developer? Web developers, okay. Um, Anyone work on, on SaaS products? Okay. Um, software, as a software as a service, yes, cloud applications. Okay. Um, Python developers. Got a lot of Python here, I hope. Cool. Uh, any, any JavaScript developers? Anyone right front end code? Cool. Um, last question Who's seen Dark Knight Rises? Okay, great. Um, if you haven't, um, first act of Dark Knight Rises. The, the big theme is um, Batman having vanquished crime in Gotham has sort of uh, recused himself from society a little bit and has um, regressed physically and socially and, and uh, culminating in the end of the first act when he gets into the big fight with Bane and um, I think Bane and towards the end of that fight yells at him, victory has defeated you. Um, this is kind of what I want to talk about a little bit. Uh, if, if you work on uh, web applications or, or, or cloud applications, oops, this is probably the environment you're used to working in. Um, you have your trusty web browser, your trusty Python web application, and your trusty database. Your database probably has a few hundred rows of data or maybe a thousand, uh, but, but a lot of this is fixture data. This is, this is the development environment I have for my product. Um, you will maybe, if you're working on a new feature, you'll write some, some SQL queries and everything will work just fine. And, um, maybe you'll, uh, go through code review with your team and, and people look at the query. Maybe they'll spot something that suggests it could be slow. Maybe not. Um, but, uh, maybe you'll, uh, pass code review and this will get deployed to this, um, which is production. Production is much more complicated than that thing that was running on your laptop. Um, there are many other processes talking to your database. Your database is much, much bigger. There's a lot more data in it. And um, uh, so we, we talk about um, something in, in software development. Oh, this is actually production because I'm a web developer. So everything is Internet Explorer, which uh, <laughs> makes me sad. But 
so so uh, this is a diagram I like to, or a graph I like to point out a lot. Um, this is the uh, cost of fixing issues relative to where they occur. So if you find issues in development, they tend to be much less costly to fix. You you can you can tweak your SQL query, or you know you can fix that bug that happened. But but when stuff moves into production, things become much more expensive to fix. Um, sometimes you have to do rollbacks or hot patches, and you might risk downtime, low performance, and stuff like that. Um, so in in at Duo. I do most of my development way over to the left. In the middle, we have these um, these environments that we deploy to as sort of like uh, uh, QA of sorts. We have a, we have a small production like environment that we test stuff on, smoke test stuff before we push it out to production. Sometimes we catch issues there. Um, sometimes that slow SQL query will will uh, turn turn itself up in in QA. Um, but the the worst case scenario is everything works fine and you push it out to production and it just just barely works. It, it, it is good enough at the time that it's deployed um, because what ultimately happens is um, something like this. Your, your product, your feature, your, your company is wildly successful and all of a sudden your production environment that once had millions of rows now has hundreds of millions or billions of rows and um, that query that you wrote uh, really starts to, to to wear down your service. And um, so what I want to talk to you about uh, this evening is uh, success and the problems that arise with success. Um, so the, the, this talk is going to um, be more broad than deep. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of different aspects of, of uh, application development and how it pertains to uh, data analytics um, and, and what we're doing at Duo to, to improve how we present uh, data. So my name is Brian Witherspoon. I'm a principal software engineer at Duo Security. Um, I've been at Duo since uh, about April 2014, uh, which means that in um, startup years, I've been there for about 45 years. Um, <laughs> I, I joined Duo um, mainly as a front-end developer, so I, I, I've done a lot with um, UI design and development, um, but in the past um, 18 months or so, I've been transitioning into more of a full-stack developer and, and concerning myself more with, with um, data infrastructure and data visualization. So that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, yes, front-end development. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I'm on the data engineering team at Duo. This is a, a relatively new team. Um, we, we kind of started ourselves right around uh, maybe uh, January this year or so. And um, I wanted to just briefly explain what we consider data engineering to be um, because uh, I, I think there's maybe just a, a bit of confusion in, in what data engineering is maybe compared to data science. And... Um, the way I like to understand the differences between data engineering and data science is if you remove data from the equation and you consider the differences between engineering and science. Um, to, to summarize this, this I'll just take that in for a second. Um, uh, more seriously, uh, so the way I like to th think about science and engineering and data science and data engineering is to think about the layers of abstraction in the directions that both of these roles operate in. So scientists will um, make observations, they will capture data, they will examine that data and maybe infer patterns and come up with theories and build data models. And then engineers will take those theories and models and uh, design systems and implement and maintain those systems. And then those systems will then, in turn, hopefully provide meaningful data back to those data scientists to, to further refine those data models. And so you have this kind of nice little feedback loop. Basically, data scientists move from concrete to abstract, and engineers move from abstract to concrete. And I think that this applies to the realms of data science and data engineering as well. Um, so with, within Duo, uh, we've, we've started to uh, kind of separate these two roles a little bit. 
we do have a data science team, and um, their chief focus is, uh, um, as I kind of mentioned, uh, data modeling and also doing some exploration into machine learning technology. Data engineering, on the other hand, um, we are concerning ourselves with um, improving how we store data, how we move it around our, our, our cloud stack, and how we visualize it to our customers. Um, sorry, my notes are bugging out. There we go. So to take a step back, I wanted to, to just briefly introduce Duo, uh, what, what our product or service is, and um, it, what value we provide to our customers. Uh, Duo, um, we provide what we call trusted access services to our customers. And what, what trusted access means to me is um, basically uh, making sure that users uh, who are trusted by the organization using devices that are healthy um, can access the applications that they are meant to access. Um, beyond that, Duo uh, provides additional value to its customers um, through uh, our, our, our core is in uh, two-factor authentication, but we also want to provide value to our customers by helping uh, them better understand how users are accessing applications in their, in their network, uh, either whether they be on-premise or in the cloud. Uh, to that end, I, I want to introduce two of our primary user personas, and this, this is going to help kind of establish sort of the, um, the data that we collect and, and how important that is to these users. Um, the first user is Gary. He's an IT administrator. Um, data security is only a portion of his job. Uh, he's the one who's mainly responsible for configuring Duo and setting up Duo in front of his on-prem and cloud applications. Um, he's constantly seeking to improve technology and IT services for his employees. Um, he's, uh, he, he has to deal with a lot of information, and so he's really concerned only on things that are out of the ordinary. Uh, he, he's also um, kind of an older version of Dane Cook for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other, the other uh, person I'd like to introduce, uh, her name's Eve. She is an employee of the same company that Gary works at. She's an end user, and she needs to be able to access um, a variety of applications, Gmail, uh, Office, um, maybe they have a WordPress blog. All of these things uh, are important to her to be able to get to when she needs to. She gets frustrated when security gets in the way or adds friction to her job, and She's, she's not an expert uh, in security or technology, uh, although she knows that security is an important thing. Um, it's, it's never at the forefront of her mind. So with, with these two uh, user personas, there's another kind of loop involved here. Uh, Gary's responsible for setting up Duo and configuring it. Eve's responsible for using it. When Eve uses it, that um, provides data, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, back to Gary. Gary's able to use that data uh, to further refine how, the, how his system's configured and um, hopefully provide Eve with a more secure and not uh, uh, blocking her from being able to do her job. Um, my purpose as a developer at Duo is to help provide Gary with the information he needs when he needs it. So at the center of all of this is this um, concept that we call the auth. And the auth is basically a record of the interaction that Eve has with our service. Every time Eve uh, approves a push notification or answers her phone and says, yes, this is me, or no, this isn't me, or anytime she enters a passcode into our service, we record that information. Um, so we consider this to be our, our largest and most critical source of data. Um, there's a lot of information that we can we can gather at, through this one single interaction. Um, we're able to identify who Eve is um, in the system. We know that maybe Gary has configured it to say this is her real name. Um, Gary can assign Eve to certain user groups within our system, and so we know that information. Um, there's also the the application that's what this rocket is supposed to represent. Um, 
uh, is she accessing WordPress? Is she accessing her VPN? Is she accessing um, uh, Office 365? And then um, where there's a lot of really good information is in the devices she's using. So if I, if I attempt to sign into something on my laptop and I use my smartphone to do 2FA, I'm able to, uh, Duo is able to, um, to know um, what, what operating system I'm using on both these devices, uh, what web browsers I have, if I'm running plugins like Flash or Java, um, understanding security features of, of, the sm of the smartphone, like if there's you know, fingerprint lock enabled or if the device is encrypted, we have all this information. We know the IP addresses of, all, of both of these devices, and so we can infer things like um, where these devices might be in the physical world as well as the reputation of these IP addresses. Are they coming from Tor networks or, um, or uh, commercial VPNs or, or something like that? So there's a lot of really awesome information in here that we, Duo, would like to gather and store, both so we understand what's going on at an industry level, but also to provide this information back to Gary so that he can make uh, intelligent decisions. At least this is what we want to have happen. Um, but currently, oh, there's also some additional um, metadata that we can collect, like there's, there's IDs, timestamps, uh, we know what customer's involved, and so on and so forth. Um, we do that big lead up again. This is what we want to have happen, but not, we, it, it's not like that because um, these kinds of queries are very expensive for us for some reason. Being able to select all the rows from a table where the username is equal to X is um, painfully slow for us and has been this way for a little while. Um, effectively, victory has defeated us because now we have so many rows in our table that it's, it's really hard to do. Cumulatively, um, currently we have about, uh, I would say about three and a half billion rows across all of our deployments out there in the world. Um, just to kind of set the, the scope of, of the scale that we're dealing with here. Yes? What type of SQL are you using? Uh, MySQL, yep. Um, so I'll come back to that. Uh, this, this, these rows are spread out amongst um, a handful of databases. Uh, we deploy our code to multiple regions in AWS. We have multiple instances of MySQL running. But um, there's, there's an average of about 60 million rows on, on certain databases. The largest one has about 1.7 billion. Um, there are some thir certain things that we have done to sort of help improve the performance of MySQL reads. Uh, we have read-only replicas that we have out there. We've, we've uh, implemented database sharding, so taking that customer ID and, and um, basically spreading data out to multiple uh, RDS instances based on which customer ID is involved. Um, the, the thing that we, we know that could provide the, the best read performance for us would be to add more indexing. However, this is kind of a non-starter for us right now at this point. Um, this would be the general process for us for adding an index to production. We would create a read replica, we would migrate that read replica, and then we, eventually we would cut over. The problem with this is that the, the rate in which we're receiving new records is so great that these migrations would take a very long time to complete, um, and, and the risk of, of data loss uh, we're, we're just a little too um, worried about. Also, adding indexes means that write latency would go up, and that's a very important thing for us, especially considering that writes to this database could possibly add lag time to uh, Eve being able to sign into her service. So all this going on, there's, there's, there's really a lot of missed opportunities for us. Um, we have all this data. We do provide ways for Gary to pull it out of our system. In, in CSV or JSON formats, and some of them take advantage of that. They'll take it and they'll suck it into like Splunk or some other log processing service. But we want uh, to be the, um, the trusted advisor for, for Gary, for his, the security of his network. So there's, it, it kind of behooves us to provide strong analytics directly within our product um, so that Gary doesn't have to do stuff like pulling out all this data all the time. So, that's kind of the, the, the context of how data engineering at Duo came to be. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we are, have done um, in the past 12 months or so, and then uh, a little bit about what we're planning on doing in the future. So our, our first goal 
was to Im improve the storage of this data. This particular data we decided probably doesn't belong in MySQL long term in order to be able to do really awesome analytics on it. Um, we looked at a few different options. We, we explored using uh, Redshift in AWS, uh, DynamoDB. Um, we even considered um, continuing to use MySQL and, and coming up with a better way of moving data into tables that had better indices. But ultimately, we settled on um, an application called Elasticsearch. And there were a few reasons that, that we chose Elasticsearch. Um, it provided a, a very flexible HTTP API for us to um, construct very uh, interesting and complex queries against. Um, adding new data to Elasticsearch uh, was much less painful than, than doing this in MySQL. We didn't have to migrate entire tables. We could simply, uh, if, we, if we did our indexing correctly, we could simply create a new index with, in, um, with the new fields defined, or we could simply throw new data at the existing indexes, and um, Elasticsearch would generally do the right thing for us. Uh, we also had some in-house experience with Elasticsearch already, as it powers our company's application logs, so the, the logs that our service gives back to us to figure out if um, things are working correctly. Um, so having that prior art um, kind of helped us feel more comfortable with using this. That's not to say that there weren't any drawbacks of using Elasticsearch. Um, being a security company, security is very important to us. Um, if, if bad actors were able to gain access to our customer logs, that would be very, very bad. So security uh, being a very important thing, Elasticsearch by default has almost no security. You stand it up and you can throw requests at it and it will give you your data back. It doesn't care who you are, who you say you are. Um, also, these the indexes that um, kind of lay underneath Elasticsearch uh, are known to certain people to be brittle. Um, they could be corrupted and lost. And so having this be our permanent storage for uh, this off-log data um, kind of gave us pause a little bit. So we had to come up with, with some, some other ways to mitigate that, which I'll get into. Um, but despite this, we were comfortable using Elasticsearch. And so we came up with uh, a a somewhat reasonable architecture for, for deploying this. Um, we decided to develop our own uh, sort of proxy application for Elasticsearch. Um, we already sort of had some, um, I, I hesitate to use the term microservices because it's kind of a little buzzwordy, but we had a, a bit of a framework in place already for creating new applications that could talk to other applications within our uh, Amazon VPC using authentication and authorization. Um, so that gave us uh, a bit of um, uh, happiness as far as, the, as far as the security bit went. Also hosting Elasticsearch uh, in AWS. AWS has Elasticsearch as a service and they uh, also have their own uh, authentication layer on top of that. So double secure. Uh, also by putting this, this sort of proxy application in here, we were able to um, basically only expose the functionality of Elasticsearch that we wanted our, our applications to have. Um, a bit about this Python service. Uh, Duo is still on Python 2 for the most part. Um, and we use uh, Twisted as, as, as our library. Any, any Twisted users? No? Oh, yeah, way back there. Um, Twisted's fun. Uh, it's it's an event driven framework. If if, if any of you have used um, Node.js or async IO, it's kind of the same sort of thing. You have this reactor that does events. Um, it basically lets us deploy applications without having to put some other web server in front of it, like GUnicorn or whatever. Um, great for networking, great for web applications. Really steep learning curve, um, but we already had this for our main service, so we decided to continue using it. There are a couple tools that we um, used to make our lives a little bit easier when building this application. There's a tool out there called Cerebro. Um, not the thing that Professor X wears in his head, but uh, a web application that sits in front of Elasticsearch and basically lets you craft queries in a web UI and, and fire them off and then see what Elasticsearch does. Almost like using the, the command line for MySQL. Um, but uh, since 
um, Elasticsearch speaks JSON over over HTTP. It, um, this kind of interface lends itself a bit better to exploring what Elasticsearch can do. We also, uh, oh, so this that Cerebro tool is very useful for development, but uh, it, you, it doesn't support being stood up in front of a, an AWS managed Elasticsearch because of their, their custom signing algorithm. Uh, so we developed our own command line tool for be, being able to fire off requests to um, an AWS managed uh, Elasticsearch. This was very helpful for us in um, debugging some production issues that came up. Okay, so, so we kind of have this, the storage um, mostly set. Now the, 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 the 1A goal was how do we move all that data into Elasticsearch, um, which proved to be a bit more of a challenge for us than we um, had uh, initially anticipated. So uh, much like we had developed a, our own application to be in front of Elasticsearch, we also wrote our own custom application for um, basically pulling data out of MySQL, transforming it, um, sprinkling it with some, some additional fun data, and then shuffling it off to, to the service to get ingested. Um, again, written and twisted, uh, we, we did some fun things like writing uh, a, uh, a process that would, instead of immediately shuffling uh, rows into Elasticsearch, would wait for a few seconds to see if any more data was going to come in. Elasticsearch is happiest when you send it lots of data in a single request rather than um, small rows one at a time. Uh, and the instances of Elasticsearch and MySQL weren't exactly one to one, so maybe we would have a single cluster that would, a single Elasticsearch cluster that would serve several of our deployments. And so multiple databases were, were ingesting data to Elasticsearch at one time, so we, we had to do some things like um, adding a cursor to each MySQL database so that we could keep track of where we were um, in the various sync processes. Um, I, I touched on some of the numbers a little bit, but um, basically, you know, our largest deployment had about um, almost 2 billion rows. On average, we were looking at 60 million rows um, for most tables um, with a median of about 3 million. Um, for most of our deployments, this sync process worked pretty well uh, straight away. For our, for our very larger ones, we ran into some issues where uh, it would simply not be able to keep up um, even with so so I showed you that one graph earlier with with the billions of rows this is this is the same data but um, uh, uh, the rate in which new auths are coming into our into our tables and we're looking at maybe across everything about 90 or so authentications per second which I don't know doesn't sound like a whole lot, but um, this, this process that we wrote was, was barely able to keep up with our largest, our second largest deployment and not able to keep up at all with that 1.7 billion uh, uh, row system. So there were a few things that, that we had to kind of go back and optimize with this process. Um, one of them being we're using Twisted. It's, it's an asynchronous framework, but we were still sending stuff serially. And we would send one batch over, and we would wait for it to come back, and send another one over and wait for it to come back. By parallelizing that, we shaved a lot of time off of, of the sync process. The other thing to do, a nice little fun Python uh, gotcha. Um, we were assembling these bodies by setting up a string, transforming each row, and appending it to that string. Um, Turns out when you're doing millions of these, that results in millions of string allocations. <laughs> um, we didn't catch this for a little while, and this was, this was really chewing up a lot of memory for us. Um, by switching this over and using an array and shoving each string into an array and then joining it at the end resulted in um, much happier memory usage. Um, I, the, the takeaway for me on that was like, we had a lot of prior art with Python 2 and Twisted, and it was great. Um, but Python lends itself, in my opinion, very well to rapid development. It, the, it, it's a very approachable language. It's a very powerful language. Um, but there, there are a lot of gotchas that you might run into um, uh, when you're starting to do things at scale and you need things to work very fast. Um, however, all of that was 
I, I, I think those those hangups were kind of worth it in the long run because we were able to stand up something a lot more quickly. Um, the other the other thing that I, I haven't really touched on a whole lot, but uh, I think is an important thing if you if you think back to that um, slide of. Uh, the cost of fixing issues relative to where they happen, um, that's not just applicable to bugs. I think that's also applicable to, to the types of data you're developing against. And if you uh, are, are not using realistic data, both in terms of scale as well as um, the, the realism of the data, the differences between your two environments are going to make it much more harder to identify issues. So. Um, if I if I could have had another stab at this, what I probably would have done is is developed against an actual cloud instance. Maybe maybe getting a read replica of one of our production instances set up. We have a we have a very strong security um, mentality of developers can't really touch what's going on in production. We have our own production engineering teams that that um, that do that. But uh, being able to get my hands on on a data set that big would have been very helpful. Okay, so. So now we have the system, now we have the data in it. Uh, the, the last uh, thing that we've been working on is presenting this stuff um, to our customers more flexibly uh, than, than what we currently were. Um, there was a slide I, 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 I kind of skipped over, but I, I meant to describe what that was. Basically, uh, in our product currently, um, we have a single page in the product that allows our customers to basically explore that data in a tabular format, which is great if you have maybe 50 rows total. But um, once you start getting in the thousands and tens of thousands and, and millions of, of uh, rows to, of, of, of authentications to look at, a table doesn't really do much um, unless you have strong filtering, which again, we couldn't have because we were using MySQL and we didn't have the right indexes. and um, so now that we had all the right tools, we, we needed to build some, some really awesome visualizations on top of it. Um, prior to this Elastic certification, uh, we were using these front-end tools called high charts and data tables. Um, and if you're, if you're um, not too familiar with front-end development, basically these are two front-end JavaScript libraries that allow you to very quickly add things like tables and, and graphs and charts and stuff like that to your to your web interface. Um, we were using these libraries because they they gave us a lot of out of the box functionality that we needed to move and iterate quickly on on things with limited development resources. Um, but this is it's really hard to see, but um, basically using these libraries requires you to basically turn a bunch of knobs. Everything is configuration driven and uh, not very friendly for, for development purposes, uh, especially when you want to be able to do something very custom. Like uh, our, our product design team is wonderful and they've been um, giving us these really great designs for, for data visualization uh, that are very specific on how things uh, should be laid out on the page. And these libraries weren't, weren't really allowing us to do this um, the way that we wanted to. Uh, so for, for front-end development, we started looking at um, a couple of libraries called React and D3. Anyone heard of React? Cool, all right. Um, React's big thing is building user interfaces in a, in a component-oriented way. And if you think about things like reports and graphs and tables, and these are very component-driven, you'll have like, your, your, your report will have a graph up here and maybe a table down here and some other graphs. So, so a component-oriented or, architecture um, kind of lines up very well with, with data visualization. React is not so great at some of the more um, detailed aspects of data visualization, like number crunching and drawing um, things like axes on graphs. And so we used uh, another awesome library called d3.js to sort of fill in the gaps. D3 is really great at number crunching and, and doing um, really fine detailed data viz work. So uh, we were able to use these two things um, in tandem to, to come up with a pretty pretty good um, system for building uh, data viz for our product. 
uh, this is just a code snippet of, of what that kind of looks like. Um, things are much more uh, programmatic and less con configuration driven. And ultimately, you're able in our product to add a donut graph to a page by simply creating a new instance of this donut graph rather than invoking this third party library and, and shoving this massive JavaScript object into it. So that's kind of where we're at today. Um, I, I, I would still consider us to be a bit in our infancy in terms of data infrastructure and data visualization, but um, I think we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, Elasticsearch was a great start for us for, for getting better analytics into our product, but I think um, Elasticsearch doesn't solve all of our use cases. Um, I think we have... Uh, aspirations of, of doing things more like near real-time and real-time analysis of this data and um, having a data pipeline in place will really help us with that. We're, we're starting to look at Apache Kafka down the road here um, pretty soon. And that will that and other things, our data science team is also looking at using Apache Spark um, to help us uh, start to process the soft log data as it's coming through so that we can do things like monitor for fraudulent and suspicious activity. You know, if Eve is normally signs in from Ann Arbor and then suddenly we get an auth in from China, um, that we would want to, you know, raise uh, a notification to, to Gary right away. And having some of these um, pipeline and processing tools in place will help enable us to do that. And uh, continuing to iterate on these, these data visualization things that, that um, we've, we've started. So that's, that's all I really have. Um, uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, as I kind of said at the start, there's, this is more of a broad talk than a deep talk. There's, there's a lot of cool stuff that we're doing that I could probably go on for hours about, but um, I don't have the time for. Uh, I, I simply just wanted to kind of introduce Duo, introduce what we're working on, and just kind of share a little more stories of sorts about um, how we're you know, dealing with success and dealing with uh, scaling. So um, again, thank you all for having me here today. And uh, if there are any questions, I would um, love to hear them. Yes. Oh, thank you. Question. Mm -hmm. The 1.7 million records, are these for a single customer or client, or are these on a single server. Yeah, so I, I will repeat the questions. Um, the question was uh, this this 1.7 billion rows, was this for a single customer? Um, I, I didn't mention this. Uh, Duo is a multi tenant service. So any one deployment could house one customer. It, in the case of that 1.7 billion one, this is the one where if you were to go to duo.com and sign up, you would end up in this particular deployment. So that, that deployment has many customers, thousands. So these are hosted on a single server, or a single cluster? Uh, a single MySQL database, correct. Or, or in the case of sharding, we, had, we have several underneath. But, but yeah, a single deployment can, help, can house many uh, customers. Yeah. Yes? Features that you're comparing, like Redshift, you said, or MongoDB, is there something they had that Elasticsearch didn't have that you guys couldn't get? Uh, yeah, so the question was for, for some of the other tech that we were looking at, uh, like Redshift or, or uh, Mongo, were there any features in there that we liked that, that we maybe lost with Elasticsearch? Was that kind of... Um, probably the, the thing that I would have liked to see that Elasticsearch didn't quite have. So when we were evaluating these things, I, I don't think Elasticsearch was actually hosted by AWS at the time, or if it was, it wasn't in all of the regions that we wanted. So we were kind of preparing ourselves to roll this stuff out ourselves and maintain it. And so um, at the time, having AWS manage this stuff for us would have been great. Um, maybe a, a particular feature. Uh, Redshift would have been cool because we we already know how to write SQL queries and having to learn this this um, this new way of, of querying stuff was was a little bit tricky. Um, yeah, that's about all I can think of. Way in the back. So I was wondering why why wasn't Redshift the right answer? The, I think the question was 
Oh, I don't think. The question was, why wasn't Redshift the answer for us? Um, you know, I, I think Redshift was probably the one that we were looking at the heaviest, aside from Elasticsearch. Um, and, and we do, in fact, use Redshift for uh, other, other purposes. Um, in fact, we, we do actually shift a lot of this data that I've been talking about into Redshift, but we use it mainly for our own internal exploration of the data. And I think, um, and I'm not an expert on Redshift, so, so if, I, if I speak something wrong, I apologize. From, from what I understand, um, just simply throwing all this data into a big Redshift table wasn't necessarily better than keeping it in a big MySQL table. So things like indexing and, um, uh, I don't know about sharding, but, but like the indexing uh, bits would, would still apply, I think. Um, that's about the best answer I can give. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of valid reasons that we could have gone with Redshift. Um, this is this is just um, why we kind of went with Elasticsearch. Uh, yeah. Any concerns with running uh, running it on Amazon's hosting service? It's very opinionated. <laughs> yes. Um, do we have concerns about running our stuff on AWS all the time? Uh, our entire service is run on AWS. So. Yeah, I mean our hosting service. Their hosted service for oh, versus running it ourselves. Yeah, um, I know for a fact that it's it's difficult for us to um, ask AWS Elasticsearch uh, certain questions about its health and and how things are running under the hood that you can do with one that you're running yourself. Um, that's been uh, a, a bit of a thorn in our sides. Um, Nothing we couldn't overcome, but uh, a lot of times uh, I've heard horror stories of, of people running man managed uh, Elasticsearch that if they were to reach out to AWS for help, AWS would just say, throw more nodes at it or up your node size and um, go away, right? Um, we haven't really run into, because we're still kind of spinning this up, we haven't really run into too many like of those nitty gritty problems that have required um, that kind of like surgical uh, stuff yet. Um, I'm hoping it never comes to that. Um, I'm one of those people. That's why I asked. Do you run your own? Do you run your own or do you use AWS Manage? Okay. I would suggest take the wheel, right? Yeah, like <laughs> investigating it. It's, it's quite a bit faster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. All the information that's going in, I take it you're actually getting it from the you know, devices themselves. And from what you're saying about if you put an index on, you have write latency, but it might actually plug up and flow the next the device. Do you consider batching those up and sending them out? Are there security considerations with that? Uh, so the, the question is, and correct me if I, if I misinterpret any of that, the question is, um, in adding indexes to the table, we would introduce write latency. And did we consider um, batching writes to that table? Uh, did, it, did that about? Batching log events from the devices. So the device doesn't send it up one by one or other in bursts. OK, so, 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 so batching um, log data from these devices uh, and, and then writing them to the table in bursts. Yeah, OK. Um, we have not considered doing something like that specifically, I, I, what would give me pause about that is the fact that um, this data is very critical for us. And so by taking data and batching it and then letting Eve proceed on, you run the risk of dropping that data on the floor if something goes wrong. If, if that database were to go offline in between the period when we let Eve go, and when we would write to that table, we would lose that data. And so um, ensuring that that data is written to the table is, is absolutely critical for us. So, so I, I imagine that would um, maybe not be a, a viable solution for us. Did that answer your question? I think so. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so kind of a two-part question. Okay. First, you talked a lot about um, some of the performance challenges of SQL databases. Mm -hmm. What are some of the bottlenecks to watch for in Elasticsearch? And in particular, is that 1.7 billion records everything in history? Or are you limiting the amount you're running these queries against? OK, two-part question. The first one is, um, have we found any bottlenecks in Elasticsearch in terms of querying? Yeah, and they can be kind of related, I found. 
Okay. Um, we haven't run across too many bottlenecks yet. Um, I, I think Elasticsearch for the most part has um, handled everything we've thrown at it. Um, in, in, uh, that 1.7 billion you mentioned. Um, well, I, I'm, I forget what the second part of that question was. So the, like all the history. So is this running against every record you have when you run these queries? Um, that 1.7 billion, we 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 take and we, um, depending on the deployment, we will put them in uh, rolling indexes. So like one for June, one for May, one for one for each month. Uh, for some of our, sm our our smaller ones, we might put them into larger indexes. And then in the product itself, we will kind of restrict it to only maybe six months of data or something like that. So, uh, yeah, is that to your question? Yeah. Great. Uh, there was, yeah. I wanna, uh, so you mentioned like the initial security aspect, and obviously, uh, but I'm more just wondering from the side of, because it's a less spatial tool of view. Mm -hmm. Because of the like, just a issue with their product overall. Like, so like they offer like security suites. Yeah. And like, I know that the downside is that it ends up being like an add-on. So, like, was that like like that major issue? Like that? Yeah. So so to to repeat the question, um, security was a concern for us, um, and was that because of any particular? Flaws in Elasticsearch, or just from the lack of yeah, a standard was, security? Yeah, I just didn't know if it was because of the version. You like, you didn't like their. I, I forget what they call their particular. Beat, it's like, like XPack or something. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah XPack has a, a certain thing in it, but yeah, so like that. So, did you use their security product to give that, or yeah. was it just? The initial open source kind of flavor of yeah. I know is on yeah. So so did we use any of the add-on tools, or, or were we mainly looking at just the the open source core itself? And and the answer to that is we started off by looking just at Elasticsearch. Um, we were hesitant about using the add-ons, um, mainly because uh, they they would add authentication to it, but that still precludes. The, the need to put Elasticsearch in a isolated contained kind of environment. So because we don't want we don't want to expose Elasticsearch to the internet for any reason, even if we had the um, that add-on in front of it, right? Um, so because of that, we decided, well, we kind of need to put this application in front of it anyway. And because our our framework already had mechanisms for authentication and, and um, authorization between some of our internal services, we decided we didn't really need to use any of those add-ons. And then, of course, we decided in the 11th hour that, oh, AWS has managed Elasticsearch where we need it. So we ended up getting that. Um, they have, they have um, user-level permissions for signing requests to, to Elasticsearch. So it ended up working out for us. Cool. Oh, one more. Yeah, did we did we look at Elasticsearch's own hosted service? And um, no, I, I think we were we were pretty dead set on trying to either either use stuff that AWS was giving us because we were all AWS or or doing our own stuff on EC2. There's yeah. Now I know as much as everybody loves legacy code, and as much as you guys use six and like everything you use iPhone side of things, uh -huh. as much as Twisted has its own little niches and flavors, are you guys even considering moving to three because of like the developments of yeah. Seek IO? Yeah. And I know that there are a lot of security libraries that still are making that migration, but the framework has been yes. very stable. It has been uh, three point Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of legacy code. Um, have we considered moving to Python three? Um, yes, we consider it all the time. Uh, I, I would I would love to get our our service up on Python three, um, and in fact I, I I am a big fan of a, async IO and um, the new async await syntax is oh it's wonderful. Um, 
ultimately, uh, there would be a lot. And, and, and in fact, uh, Twisted has pretty pretty good interop with uh, async I/O now in, in I think version 17 or, or pretty recently. So, um, if we were to migrate, I, I I imagine at this point it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Um, 2020 is still a long way away for us, so. <laughs> Bring on new oh, it, yeah. It was an understatement when you said Twisted is a steep learning. Yeah. Thing. It is a nightmare, yes. especially for somebody that's coming into the framework and not really knowing the first thing about it. Yeah. But if you move to that async await, it's a whole lot more intuitive. I don't know if you guys are thinking about it. Um, the the drum to develop our product uh, continues to beat day to day, and so. Uh, it's. Um, I would. I would love for us to be able to, to pick that up. Um, but yeah, I'm very much in tune with the whole. We have to balance what we have and the the legacy of our of our existing code with the new stuff we want to do. Um, Duo's had a few greenfield side projects where we've started using Python three, and and those have worked out wonderfully. Um, we uh, our, our core product is a pretty big monolith. Um, I, I think over time we're starting to add stuff separately. We chose for this particular um, uh, project to, to, to continue with that model, but uh, we've also done stuff um, more Greenfield where we build a new project from scratch and then get those two things to talk to each other even though they're pretty separate code bases. So um, we're, we're, we're going in that direction. I hope we go a little more quickly. Yeah. Oh, yes. I was curious about, do you have any exposure to what you're doing with the Spark cluster and the streaming data? Yeah, the question was, do I... You're going to use the Lambda architecture for that. The AWS Lambda? Lambda? Well, no, it's uh, in Spark with okay. incorporating streaming data with the, the lingo yeah. using the Lambda architecture. Okay, the, the question was, uh, am I exposed to what's going on with um, with Spark in our organization? Unfortunately, no. I That's more than going on with our data science team. And um, them being new as well, they've been kind of doing proof of concept stuff uh, on their own. And um, in the coming quarters, we're going to start converging and, and working on stuff together. But um, I, I sadly don't know very little about Spark. Um, I'm going to become more familiar with it in, in, the, in the next few months. But yeah, that's all I have for that. All right. All right. So uh, I want to remind everybody, uh, please do sign up for our lightning talks. Uh, for October 10th, and let's give uh, another big round of applause for Brian.